This video is going to explore topics 6.5 and 6.6, .6, regulation of gene expression and gene expression and cell specialization. Gene expression involves the process of acting upon a cell's genetic material that will result in a functional protein. That protein is responsible for carrying out a particular task contributing to the cell's phenotype. Prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have gene regulation mechanisms in place to ensure that proteins are appropriately produced. However, the underlying reasons for which gene regulation is necessary differs between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Additionally, how eukaryotic genes are organized and regulated is far more complex than for prokaryotic organisms. This helps to explain why current understanding of gene regulation in prokaryotes far exceeds that of eukaryotes. Bacterial cells that can conserve raw materials and energy have an advantage over cells that are unable to do so. Evolution by natural selection, therefore, has favored bacteria that express only the genes whose products are needed by the cell during a particular time. Prokaryotes manage the expression of their genes using a regulatory system called an operon. An operon is a functioning unit of DNA containing a gene, or cluster of genes, under the control of a single promoter. An important advantage of grouping genes with related functions is that a single switch can control the entire group of functionally related genes. The switch segment of the DNA is called the operator. The operator, which is part of the promoter in some operons, exists just upstream of the controlled genes and controls the access of RNA polymerase to those genes. The promoter is the region of DNA to which RNA polymerase will bind to the start of transcription. Just downstream of the promoter and the operator are the genes that are controlled by the operon and are either activated or deactivated depending upon the function of the operon. There are two primary types of operons, inducible and repressible operons. An inducible operon is usually off but can be stimulated when a specific molecule interacts with a regulatory or repressor protein. The most typical example of an inducible operon is the LAC operon, LAC being short for lactose. When lactose is absent, the repressor protein is active. The active conformation of the repressor protein allows it to bind to the operator. This prevents RNA polymerase from gaining access to the controlled genes whose protein products are involved with the utilization of lactose. But when the inducing molecule, allolactose, is present, it binds to the repressor protein, changing its conformation into an inactive state. Allolactose is a naturally occurring isomer that coexists in small amounts with lactose. The repressor protein, its conformation now changed, is no longer able to bind to the operator. Consequently, RNA polymerase is now free to transcribe the genes of the operon. Repressible operons work in a manner similar to inducible ones, but the important difference between them is that repressible operons default to an active state and the repressor protein's default conformation prevents it from binding to the operator. The TRIP operon is a classic example of a repressible operon. TRIP is short for tryptophan, which is an amino acid produced by an anabolic pathway that involves five genes and their products. Bacterial cells manufacture a supply of tryptophan for use in the construction of polypeptides. Once the concentration of tryptophan reaches sufficiently high levels, it binds to the repressor protein, changing its conformation. This conformational shift activates the repressor protein, allowing it to bind to the operator. RNA polymerase is therefore prevented from transcribing the operon's genes, 
ensuring that the bacterial cell doesn't waste raw materials and produce more tryptophan than necessary. But as the cell uses its supply of tryptophan, and because the binding of tryptophan to the repressor protein is reversible, once the concentration of the amino acid reaches a sufficiently low level, there isn't enough of it to bind to the repressor proteins. The repressor protein reassumes its inactive conformation and the production of tryptophan resumes. The regulation of eukaryotic genes involves many more mechanisms than that of prokaryotes. Regulation is managed in the nucleus, prior to transcription, and after transcription. It also occurs in the cytoplasm before, during, and after translation. Regulation of gene expression is essential for cells to specialize in multicellular organisms. To perform its role, a given cell type must maintain a specific set of proteins that are being expressed. Generally, all of the cells within an organism contain an identical genome. However, the subset of genes expressed in the cells of a particular type is unique which allows them to carry out their specific function. A typical human cell expresses only about one-fifth of the protein coding genes at any particular time. You may recall from an earlier topic that eukaryotic genetic material consists of DNA that is wrapped around clustered proteins called histones. This DNA histone complex is called chromatin. Gene regulation in eukaryotes begins with how the chromatin is modified and packaged. Chromatin modifications influence the expression of genes, in some cases promoting transcription, and in others preventing it. Evidence exists that chemical modifications to histones play a role in the regulation of gene transcription. Histones have tail-like structures that protrude outward and are accessible to a variety of enzymes that can add or remove chemical groups to them. One such group is the acetyl group, which, when added to the histone tails, appears to promote transcription. Histone acetylation accomplishes this by opening up the chromatin structure, resulting in it being more loosely packaged and making it more accessible to RNA polymerase. Although some modifications occur to the histones, a different set of modifications involves certain bases in the DNA itself, typically cytosine. The addition of methyl groups to cytosine is responsible for discouraging transcription. Long stretches of inactive DNA are generally more methylated than regions of actively transcribed DNA. The chromatin modification examples presented do not involve a change in the DNA sequence, but they are heritable by future generations of cells. The chemical modifications to the genome of a parent cell are passed on to their daughter cells. This type of inheritance of chromatin modifications is referred to as epigenetic inheritance. The study of epigenetics is very active, and researchers are collecting more and more evidence as to how important epigenetic inheritance is. It may help to explain why identical twins may in fact have slightly different phenotypes. Quite recently, research has emerged that experiences, particularly those in childhood, and especially those involving traumatic events, may result in epigenetic changes that stay with us for years. To learn a bit more about epigenetics, please click on the link above to view a video from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research. Eukaryotic genes and the regions of DNA that control them are arranged as this typical model shows. Associated with most eukaryotic genes are control elements which are segments of non-coding DNA that are important in regulating transcription. Each eukaryotic gene has a promoter, a sequence where RNA polymerase binds and begins transcription. 
Control elements can be just upstream of the coding region, the proximal control elements, or can be much farther upstream and are called enhancers. Enhancers may be thousands of nucleotides away from the coding region. Although a particular gene may have multiple enhancer elements, they are generally associated with only that gene. A gene's enhancers associate with activator proteins and transcription factors to begin the process of transcription. First, activator proteins bind to the enhancer. Then, a protein responsible for bending the DNA brings the activators closer to the promoter region. Mediator proteins and proteins called transcription factors then interact with the activator proteins to trigger the binding of RNA polymerase to the DNA. The formation of the transcription initiation complex on the promoter signals the RNA polymerase to begin transcribing. One of the most important elements of gene regulation is the expression of different sets of genes in different cell types in multicellular organisms. Since nearly all cells contain an identical genome, what allows any given cell type to possess a particular shape or perform a given set of functions are the genes that it expresses. Both liver cells and cells in the lens of the eye have the genes for making the protein albumin, a blood protein, and crystalline, the main lens protein. But in this example, only liver cells make albumin and only the lens cells make crystalline. The presence of specific transcription factors in the cell determine which genes are expressed. In this example, the genes for albumin and crystalline are shown at the top, and each has an enhancer made up of three differing control elements. The availability of a different collection of activators in each of the cells prevents them from manufacturing a protein that is unnecessary for their function. This contributes to a given cell's ability to carry out specific functions. Just because a gene is transcribed doesn't mean that it will be expressed in the cell's phenotype. The expression of a protein coding gene is ultimately gauged by how much of a functional protein a cell makes. Researchers are discovering more and more regulatory mechanisms that operate at various stages of transcription. One mechanism by which cells regulate expression was studied earlier in this unit alternative RNA splicing. This model illustrates the gene for troponin T expressed in skeletal and cardiac muscle. This single gene can be spliced in alternative ways so that, when translated, different but related muscle proteins are produced. Beyond the nucleus, additional regulatory mechanisms are active before, during, and after translation. The duration of a messenger RNA molecule's existence in the cytoplasm is important in determining the pattern of protein production in a cell. mRNA in multicellular eukaryotes may exist for a few hours, a few days, or even a few weeks. The length of time that a messenger RNA is present in the cytoplasm is directly proportional to how much of the protein resulting from it would be created. For some mRNAs, the initiation of translation can be blocked by regulatory molecules that bind to portions of it, preventing ribosomes from attaching. Upon the completion of translation, polypeptides often undergo physical or chemical modifications. One such example of a physical modification involves the initial polypeptide for insulin. That polypeptide is cleaved into smaller segments, forming the active hormone. Many proteins undergo chemical modifications, such as the addition of cofactors or coenzymes. Also, the length of time that a protein functions in a cell is regulated by mechanisms of selective degradation. To tag proteins for destruction, the cell attaches small protein molecules to them which identifies them for destruction by intracellular enzymes. 
active research studies are investigating the action of microRNAs. MicroRNAs are known to associate with messenger RNA molecules, targeting them to prevent them from being translated. Another class of RNA molecules called small interfering RNAs are different from microRNAs in only subtle ways, yet produce similar results. The blocking of gene expression by small interfering RNA is called RNA interference and has been taken advantage of in lab experiments to disable specific genes to study their function. During embryonic development, multicellular organisms' cells undergo modifications, leading to them becoming differentiated to carry out specialized tasks. Prior to specialization, stem cells are the undifferentiated cells that have yet to undergo those modifications. As an embryo grows and more cells are produced, different sets of genes in different cells are either activated or inhibited as the cells develop into very specific kinds. Early in embryonic development are totipotent stem cells. They have the potential to become any one of the nearly 200 cell types. Totipotent stem cells give rise to pluripotent stem cells. There are three types of pluripotent stem cells based on the layers of tissue of the developing embryo. Multipotent stem cells, sometimes referred to as adult stem cells, are limited in their potential. They are only capable of producing cells of related types, such as blood cells. That wraps up this presentation. Thank you for watching. Take care.